Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Mysterious and Spooky, written by Act 1308. Francesco didn't know how long it had been since he'd been banished, since his mortal form was destroyed, and he was sent to wander the endless limb between life and death. Most would have accepted their fate and passed on to the great beyond. But he was different. He had a reason to maintain his existence, a purpose to fulfill. People had to die. More to the point, at least one of his victims had to perish in agony and terror so that he could possess them and seek vengeance on his killers. His true name was not Francesco, of course. He had heard once that the great clowns of Europe had taken a high-sounding name as a parody of royalty to which they paid court, so he'd done the same. People had laughed at him for doing so, laughed! Not at his antics as Francesco, but at him for taking such a high fulleton name. He'd been mocked and scorned, so of course he'd had to strike back. The dull-witted bumpkins could easily beat him to a pulp if he came at them head on, so he had little recourse but to sneak up and slither his way into their houses, to introduce ground glass into their food and rat poison to their moonshine. Some had been strangled in their sleep, while others had been hacked to pieces with an axe. But it was their children who proved to be his undoing. The children he left until the last under the mistaken impression that they would be the easiest victims. Half a dozen of these little rats, along with the irritatingly yappy little dog, had undone his plans and brought him low. He'd nearly gotten them on more than one occasion, but time and time again they'd wriggled free of his traps and eventually turned the tables on him with his very last one. The door he had rigged to be proof against opening by either the stronger of the boys or the crafty of the girls had held firm against him after he was decoyed in there. Even the tiniest of vents and exits had been sealed to prevent so much as a scraggly mutt from wriggling free and somehow fetching help. When the door had slammed shut on him and the children fled his wrath, the coal oil had spilled down through the holes in the ceiling as it had been intended to do. Even the auto-lighting feature of the trap had gone off perfectly, much as he could have wished it didn't. And so the house caught fire and burned, and him was in it. He had died, slowly and in great agony, just as he had desired for them. Some may have saluted them as worthy opponents and gone on to whatever reward they'd earned, but not Francesco. He wanted revenge. The years had flickered by like wisps of fog by the time he returned his essence to the mortal plane. Not very much to his surprise, he found that the house that had been built on foundations of ones that he'd perished in possessed harshly gothic lines. Even in the absence, his anger and pain had twisted the intent of the builders, so that the construction looked more like it belonged in a high mountain pass in Transylvania than in middle America. In other words, it was perfect. Whoever ventured within was going to suffer terribly at his immaterial hands before they died. And speaking of which, it appeared he had already made victims at hand. Pushing aside the spiked gate, venturing up the non-Euclidean crazy paving, past the overgrown thorn bushes to the towering front door. Almost tumbling within anticipation, he drifted down into the front hallway, ready to see them close up for the first time. The door creaked open, sounding as though the carpenter had heard of oil but decided to have nothing to do with it. One by one, they trooped inside, a tall fit man looking around with fiery interest, his dark-haired wife surveying the room with a cool reserve and a mysterious smile. A girl all in black with twin plaits and a poker face that could rival any gambler Francesco had ever seen, and a fat boy with a glint in his eyes that screamed that he was the type to poke and pry into places he wasn't supposed to. 
A bald, fat man with more than a hint of crazy in his expression. An ancient crone of a woman. And finally, a seven-foot monster of a man who is carrying all of the suitcases. Ah! exclaimed the first man in ringing tones, throwing out his arms in a flourish. This is perfect! Guarada Maya! I could not think of a better vacation home. Francesco wondered if the newcomer had problems with his sight. All the furniture in the main hall had sheets thrown over it, and cobwebs stretched from the wall to ceiling. And yet, he called it perfect. Children, you may go explore, his wife suggested. Mother, perhaps you can find the kitchen while Lurch brings in the rest of the luggage. Before the sentence was fully out of her mouth, the fat boy had launched himself up the main staircase, yelling something about dibs in the best room. His sister followed. Much less precipitately, with a deadpan, shall we see, brother, while her mother continued to give orders. Francesco followed the girl. If he could give her a fright early on, he reasoned, she would be easy to reduce to hysteria later. Ignoring the sound of a spooning smack followed by a, I'm okay, that suggested the boy had jumped on a mattress and a dead run and bounced off and hit the wall. The girl turned aside into what appeared to be the bathroom a festooned with cobwebs as the main hall. It had mirrors on all three sides of the room. Francesco gathered his energy and focused his will. All the hate and anger that he felt at the world flowed into the mirrors. The temperature in the room dropped by a few degrees. The trickles of blood began to run down the glass, and the girl ignored it. It wasn't that she didn't see it. She seemed to peer at one of the blood runnels and frowned slightly before she turned away to investigate the bench. Running her fingertip over it, she examined the results. Her finger was black with grime. Francesco concentrated even harder when the girl turned around, paint in blood on the wall wall with the words, You will die here. It was really ectoplasm that he could remove in an instant if she called for an adult but it definitely looked genuine. He waited for the fit of hysterics or even a scream of terror. If she tried to bolt from the room, he was going to slam the door and lock it, so she would be half mad from fear before anyone found her. She did none of that, strolling over to the blood writing. She dabbed her finger in it, then put her finger in her mouth. Hmm, she murmured to herself. Rude. Francesco struggled to understand why she was acting this way. Why she wasn't running or screaming. I have it. She's paralyzed with terror. After standing immobile before the warning message for a few seconds longer, the girl opened the bathroom door and leaned out into the hallway. Brother dear, she called in that same emotionless voice. Aha! Her wits have befuddled with fear, and she is attempting to call for help. The boy's head popped out of the door further down. He looked altogether too happy for someone who festooned with spider webs and had a large black widow crawling on his face. Yeah, you may have first pick of bedrooms, but this bathroom is mine. What? That made no sense. What? Why? The boy apparently agreed with Francesco's query. He peered suspiciously past her into the bathroom, still oblivious to the black widow, which was investigating his left ear. It's haunted, therefore I claim it. What? He shoved past her into the bathroom. Ah, oh, man, you already got bleeding mirrors and a death threat. I want a cool haunted bathroom too. Well then, you are going to have to find your own. The boy looked like he wanted to cry. Mom, Wednesday won't share her haunted bathroom. Then mother's voice floated back up the staircase. Wednesday, dear, share your toys with your brother. Haunted bathrooms? The father sounded positively thrilled. Morticia, my darling, we scored a real bargain with this one. Wednesday, who even names their child that, gave her brother a narrow-eyed stare. You have prevailed this time, brother dear, but I will have my revenge. Despite actually being a ghost, Francesco felt goosebumps run down his immaterial spine at the menace in her voice. The children were clearly insane. He was likely to have better results, the adults. As he drifted down the staircase, he heard the girl say, You are aware that there is a black widow attempting to nest in your left ear, are you not? Oh yeah, her brother enthused. Isn't she pretty? I'm calling her Esmeralda. You call every spider you get Esmeralda. Even the boy wants utterly, utterly insane. 
Francesco drifted down through the house and found the parents unpacking some of the suitcases. There was a rack on one side of the room, now holding several weapons. Francesco decided not to try his knife with the battle axe, but the tuning sabers caught his eye. After the mother, Morticia, left the room on some errand, he lifted one of the sabers from the stand. It strained his ectoplasmic energy to lift and move it, but he forced it onward, aiming it at the man's back. <laughs> with the twisting evasive move, these would-be victims moved to side from the attempted attack. Very nice dish! Come see this! Before Francesco could bring the saber around again, the man had taken another one of the weapons from the rack. Blade clashed against Blade, his opponent holding an arm behind his back as he moved forward and backwards. He seemed to be positively enjoying himself as he fended off Francesco's attack. Gomez, what is it? Morticia emerged from the other doorway. Oh, I see. How delightful. Francesco decided to change targets, turning the blade towards the woman. Perhaps if the man saw his wife hurt or killed, he would drop his guard. But before he could get to her, a saber blew past him. She caught it at royalty and fended off his blow. Where did you find this one, darling? She asked as Francesco tried again, but his every effort failed. She was clearly as adept at fencing as a husband. I don't know, he replied happily. It just showed up. Well, this house is certainly a keeper, Morticia declared, parrying another determined assault. We might have to move here part-time. His ectoplasmic strength almost strained. Francesco moved back, the saber drooping. He had no idea what was going on, but these adults seemed almost as demented as the children. Confirming his thoughts, Gomez turned towards Patricia. And guard! he cried, his sword flickering out towards her. She responded to his sally with a flickering repost that sent him dancing backwards, with white teeth gleaming in a broad smile as their blades rang lightly against each other. If anything, Francesco thought Gomez was trying even harder to skewer her than his own poor efforts had managed. Drooping the saber so the point stuck to the floorboards, Francesco left the room. Behind him, Gomez and Morticia didn't seem to notice as they continued their impromptu saber duel. The sound of metal on metal was a reminder that no matter how hard he tried, his revenge on the living was forever out of reach. When he reached the kitchen, he found a large cauldron in the place of an oven. A fire had been lit under it, and the old woman was busy stirring something in it. He had no sense of smell, so he didn't know what it was, but the steam that rose looked somehow unpleasant. On the bench nearby were rows of bottles. Francesco looked more closely, and found to his delight that many bore warnings about poison and horrific death. When the old woman turned her back to get more firewood, he snatched up one bottle after another and emptied them into the cauldron. She returned to her stirring, occasionally dropping some dried root or herb into the mix, without ever seeming to notice the empty bottles. Chuckling to himself, Francesco slunk off into the dark recesses of the house. When the intruders into his domain tasted that dead brew, they would know his vengeance at last. Finally, he would be reborn into a new body. Time passed all too slowly. But eventually the family gathered around the long table, which had a row of candles on it. Gomez sat at one end with Matisha at his right hand. Wednesday with her brother sat across from each other with the old woman beside the boy, and the fat bald man at the far end. There was one empty chair, which Francesco figured would belong to the enormous manservant. What was he called? Lurch? It suited him. As if thinking of his name summoned him, Lurch appeared from the direction of the kitchen, bearing a tray with bowls of a concoction which he had been stewing in the cauldron. Everyone got a bowl, and the larger one was placed in the middle of the table. Francesco cackled quietly to himself. Nobody would survive to take seconds. Lurch seated himself, and each of the diners applied themselves to the meal. Only two or three spoonsfuls in, Morticia turned to the old woman, Mother, she exclaimed, the stew tastes positively divine. What have you done differently? The old woman appeared into the spoon she was holding, squinting, as though she could determine the ingredients merely by looking at it. I don't know, she said in a high-pitched cackle. I made it just the same as normal. Maybe because the scorpion tails were dried instead of fresh. Well, I like it, 
Gomez said hotly. I vote you make it this way every time. At the end of the table, the fat man hiccuped and raised a finger. What is it, Festa? asked Morticia. Was there something you wanted to say? Festa nodded, then opened his mouth and belched a deep and long. The effusions from his erection struck the first candle, causing a blast of flame to erupt half the length of the table. When it died away, the candle was melted a good third of its length, and both children were holding cooked marshmallows on sticks. That was a good one, Uncle Festa. The boy enthused, then dipped his marshmallow in the stew and ate it. Can you do it again? Can I? Festa had an annoying voice that managed to be both high-pitched and gravelly at the same time. Watch me! He began shoveling stew into his mouth as fast as he could. Lost in dismay and frustration, Francesco drifted away again. No matter what he tried, the inhabitants of this house took his deadliest attempts on their lives and sanity and positively encouraged them. What kind of people were they? Eventually, his meanderings left him back to the kitchen, where there was now a game of cards going on. Vesta was there, along with Lurch, Morticia's mother, and what looked like a disembodied hand. As he watched, the hand laid down his cards, snapped its fingers for attention, then tapped the table. Two cards, thing. Here you go. Vesta picked up the deck and skimmed two cards into the hand's hand then looked around directly at Francesco. Oh, hey, look, Granny, it's our house guest. You mean, it's my little kitchen helper, cackled Granny. I saw him poking around when I was cooking, but I never thought he added something to the stew. She smiled broadly, showing missing teeth, as she beckoned. Come on in, join the game. What, what? You can see me. Francesco was taken aback, but, but nobody can see me. We can all see you, Vesta explained kindly, as he dealt out five cards to an empty spot. For Adamses, that's what makes us special. We just pretend not to when you're trying to be invisible. Uh, that's just manners. As if in a dream, Francesco drifted around the side of the table and exerted himself to pick up the cards. But I've been trying to kill you all. Lurch made a noise like a malfunctioning rock crusher. After a moment, Francesco figured out that the man mountain was laughing. Don't mind him, Vesta said, pitching his voice quietly enough that they probably could have heard him no further than the third floor. Murder attempts are how we Adamses say hello. You'll fit right in here. I mean, I remember the time I was being pursued by a vampire in Transylvania mountains. Night and day he chased me, all because I'd skipped out on the bar tab. What about that time that I had to fight the, the werewolf? complained Granny. I mean, uh, it was Cousin Loretta, but she had this terrible thing about shedding all over the furniture. So one day I had enough. Loretta, I said, you're going to have to clean up after yourself. Insane, thought Francesco. They're all insane. But that's okay. Because I think I've gone mad too. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons and channel members. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Arishakal, Dragzoon, WRE, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.